Standard narrative has holes. And we're proud of that. Standard narrative has holes. And we're proud of that. I can think of two things that have been perfectly preserved. This book and this human being. But even though we can all agree that my friend Yorick here has been perfectly preserved from the day he was born, there's still quite a bit of disagreement about whether the Quran has been perfectly preserved. Some Muslim scholars, like Sheikh Yasser Qadi, do believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved. Other Muslim scholars, like Sheikh Yasser Qadi, don't believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved. Whom should we believe here? I say we should let the two Sheikh Yasser Qadis lay out their claims in an epic debate so we can see who's telling the truth. We'll start with Sheikh Yasser Qadi speaking to a predominantly Christian audience in a church. Uh, and the Quran, uh, there's only one uh, Quran, there are no various versions or, or whatnot, it's one standard copy of the Quran across the Muslim world. And uh, really there's not been any variant versions of the Quran. The Quran is the Quran for all sects and schisms and groups of Islam. And we also, all Muslims take pride in the fact there is but one Quran, there's no variants of the Quran. Did you catch that? There's only one Quran with no variants anywhere. There is but one Quran, there's no variants of the Quran. Dr. Qadi is adamant that there are no variants. Indeed, he declares on his YouTube channel that there hasn't been so much as a single letters difference between any two manuscripts of the Quran from the time of the Caliph Uthman. So the Caliph Uthman standardized the copies of the Quran and therefore from his time up until our time, there has never been two copies of the Quran that are different even in one letter or one word. And this is because of the farsightedness of the Caliph Uthman. And really Muslims are very humble and very proud and very uh, grateful to God that they're the only religious group that can with so, so much authority say that their scriptures really have been preserved authentically. The Quran is the most protected of all scriptures. And in fact, we as Muslims believe that God in his divine wisdom and plan has protected the Quran from any type of alteration, from any type of deviation, from any type of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, mis of miswriting. Or well, Sheikh Yasser Qadi has presented his case for the perfect preservation of the Quran. Unfortunately for Sheikh Yasser Qadi, he didn't realize that he'd be facing Sheikh Yasser Qadi, who's about to blast these claims by Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Let him have it, Sheikh Yasser Qadi. And when we say the various different ways to recite the Quran, we are not talking about different voices or different styles. We're talking about slight differences in pronunciations, slight differences in letters, slight differences in harakat. In other words, if you were to compare two printed Qurans, you're going to see differences between them. Especially those who have been exposed to uh, some of our brothers who live in Algeria or Morocco or other North African countries, they recite the Quran in a slightly different way. Not just a voice or not just a, a, a speaking style, but also changes in letters and, and, and words and uh, harakat. And these variances are memorized in specialized institutions known as the schools of the Qiraat. Wow! So, country Contrary to Sheikh Yasser Qadi's claim that there are no differences between any two copies of the Quran, there are, in fact, differences? In other words, if you were to compare two printed Qurans, you're going to see differences between them. There are different letters and different words? Changes in letters and, and, and words and uh, harakat. There are variants? And these variances are memorized in specialized institutions. But didn't Sheikh Yasser Qadi say that there were no differences between any two copies of the Quran since the time of Uthman? No differences in letters? No differences in words? No variants whatsoever? Whom should we believe here? Uh, what is your position in relation to preservation of Quran? Is, for example, Hafsa and Asim, the way Hafsa and Asim, do you see it as preserved, munazzal from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Every single student of knowledge knows who studies Ulum al Quran that the most difficult topics are Ahruf and Qiraat. And the concept of Ahruf and the reality of Ahruf and the relationship of the Rahmani Musaf with the Ahruf and the preservation of the Ahruf is it one, is it three, is it seven, and the relationship of the Qiraat to the Ahruf. When you do a deep dive, is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. Many people are aware who listen to my lectures that I've mentioned the crises that happened to me at Yale. Now, for the first time, I'm telling you here, what was the crisis? I mentioned it, referenced it, but I never explicitly said it. Why didn't I say it? Because it should not be said in public. You can't handle the truth! This was not something I brought to the public. You can't handle the truth! And I would never bring it up in public. You can't handle the truth! And I don't think it is wise to bring it up in public. You can't handle the truth! This was the issue. That the issue of ahruf and preservation and qiraat and relationships between them, these are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars, they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered questions in there. I don't want to get into that issue. Okay, Why do I not want to get to that issue? Here's the point. These issues should only be discussed amongst people who know what the Qiraat are. You can't handle the truth! What was the crisis? The crisis was very simple. And by the way, this is now a well-known open secret amongst many Muslim graduate students and, and, and academics around the world. And yeah. this is well-known. Traditional understandings of Ahruf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, and that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. 
And they're gonna just, you know, the, the, the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're gonna just point out, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true, and this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not gonna mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. They'll bring you riwayat and they'll bring you athar, and then you add to that very well-known issues of, I don't even wanna be explicit. You can't handle the truth. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes. That's what I'm gonna say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. That the standard narrative has holes. 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 That the standard narrative That the standard narrative That the standard narrative You'll finish has holes. It has holes. That the standard narrative That the standard narrative That the standard narrative You'll finish has holes. It has holes. Most Muslims don't know anything about Ahruf and Kirat, so they don't even know that there's something to be confused about. They've been told that there's only one Quran, perfectly preserved from the time of Muhammad, without a single difference anywhere in any manuscript of the Quran. That's the stage of total ignorance. Explore the comment section of one of my videos about the Quran, and you'll see how common this stage truly is. But the beginning student of knowledge starts looking into the history of the Quran, and he finds out that the Quran was somehow revealed in seven different ways, and that there are different versions of the Quran even today, and that Uthman burned the earliest Quran manuscripts in order to cover up the differences. And how does the beginning student of knowledge react? When you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? What is this mess? Now, the reaction should be, wait a minute, I've been told all my life that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter, and now I find out that it was all a lie. I guess I can't trust the scholars and apologists who lied to me for all these years. But for some reason, that just isn't the reaction. Instead of recognizing that he's been lied to, the beginning student of knowledge goes to his scholars and apologists and asks them to explain the different ahruf and kirat and missing chapters and missing passages and textual variants. Notice, he goes to the same scholars and apologists who lied to him all his life. And what happens? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out, and you don't fully comprehend. So before he began studying the evidence, the student of knowledge believed his scholars and apologists when they told him that there's only one Quran, not a single difference in any manuscript anywhere. When he finds out that they lied about that, he goes back to them anyway, and they tell him that the Ahruf are just different dialects and that differences in the manuscripts today are just accents and other such nonsense. And he memorizes these responses and mindlessly regurgitates them. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. Things get very awkward and difficult. Why? Because he realizes that the responses he memorized from his scholars and apologists don't really work. Shocker, the people who lied to him about the perfect preservation of the Quran also lied to him about the Ahruf and Kirat and textual variants and so on. Now, recall the four stages. First, there's the ignorance stage, when you have no clue what the evidence is. You've only heard myths from your scholars and apologists. Second, there's the confusion stage, when you've been exposed to some of the evidence and you realize that you've been lied to. Third, there's the regurgitation stage, when you memorize and regurgitate what your lying scholars and apologists tell you. Fourth, there's the awkwardness stage, when you realize that you've been memorizing and regurgitating total nonsense. What is all of this going on here? What is all of this going on here? What is all of this going on here? The fallout from Yasser Qadi Gate continues. Muslim scholars spent years convincing their gullible followers that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. Eventually, non-Muslims started putting different versions of the Quran and different Quran manuscripts right in the faces of Muslims. Muslims ran to their scholars, begging them to defend the Quran. Instead, their scholars finally admitted that there are holes in the narrative. The standard narrative has holes. That's what I'm going to say. Unfortunately for Yasser Qadi, there are so many holes in the narrative, he fell into one. Now he's stuck in a hole, so what does he do? He keeps digging and digging and digging. Yasser Qadi just scrubbed the interview from the internet. I had the link to the video because I shared the link and invited people to watch Yasser Qadi expose the Quran. But if you click on the link now, what do you see? Video unavailable. This video is private. Like the hundreds of verses that are missing from the Quran, this video has been abrogated. It's not wise. Muhammad Hijab got so many complaints from Muslims about Yasser Qadi admitting that there are holes in the narrative that he was forced to abrogate part of the interview. But Sheikh Yasser Qadi wanted to show that he's not scared of the truth and that he's got nothing to hide. So he posted the interview on his channel. Then he saw how his words were being used to expose the myth of perfect preservation. He saw that I was posting clips from his interview to expose lies about the Quran. What did he do? He filed a false copyright complaint to YouTube. Yasser Qadi also realized that Muslims were complaining. They were telling him in the comments that he was going to have to answer to Allah for destroying their faith. So Yasser Qadi abrogated the comments section. But that wasn't enough. Muslims kept complaining. And now the entire video has been abrogated. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. 
fact, on June 9th of this year, I posted a video of Yasser Qadi describing problems with the preservation of the Quran. However, efforts have been made, predictably, by Muslims to conceal the controversy, like they conceal everything else that they find inconvenient about their religion. Muhammad Hijab edited the most controversial parts of Yasser Qadi's statements, thus sanitizing the video for his channel. Now, for Qadi's part, he did post the entire video on his channel, but received many negative comments, so comments were disabled. Now, of course, the entire video that was on Qadi's channel has been removed, and the drama continues. But first, here's some background. I'll put several links in the pinned comment for you, so I won't go over them in detail. But in those links, you'll find, among other things, a series of conversations that show in 2016, Fareed leaked a confidential series of emails with some controversial statements made by Yasser Qadi. These leaked emails eventually made it to someone who had a problem with Yasser Qadi and made those emails public. The emails are a discussion between Fareed and Ismail Ibrahim. Ibrahim ran the secretive discussion group from which Fareed, popular Muslim apologist, leaked Yasser Qadi's doubts about the preservation of the Quran back in 2016. At times, there's quite a fiery exchange between Fareed and Ibrahim and several interesting admissions, including this one. It is needless to say that this error in judgment led to this fiasco in which laymen are exposed to this great danger. Later, Ibrahim went on to suggest Fareed may be Satan in human form. And according to a recent post by Ibrahim, Muslims are apostatizing as a result of a flare-up on the Kira'at issue of late. And the public attacks and criticisms of Yasser Qadi continue. Here are some of the comments that I've been receiving in my videos recently. It looks like Islamophobes and critics of Islam have found someone that they can finally rely on. Thank you, Yasser Qadi. Yasser Qadi claims that the reason he is planning to spread his views is due to pressure from Orientalists. So far, he's only been fueling them. The arrow has left the bow, Yasser Qadi. Thanks for making Muslims' lives a little more harder than they already were. No matter what you say now, it is evident that your poor choice of words have caused confusion. As a scholar of knowledge, you should know this heavy topic shouldn't be discussed in public. Unnecessary controversy has been created because of that. It is not becoming of a scholar to have poor choice of words so often about such crucial and complex topics. You are out of your depth. At this point, there are two factors I would like to comment on. One of these, to be honest, is the colossal stupidity of the way some Muslims are handling these issues. In Muslim culture and religion, they've been trained to destroy evidence or suppress embarrassing problems. Got Qurans you don't like? If you're Uthman, burn them. If you're Al-Hajjaj, scrape the text off of the manuscript with the bone of a pig and then lament that you couldn't kill the person who wrote it. If you're the Egyptian government back in the 1920s, then just dump the variant Qurans in the Nile River. Modern Muslims got a prophet who recited satanic verses according to the consensus of the early Muslims and attested to in about 50 early reports. Just deny it and deny it again and keep on denying it and get more people to deny it. Sheikh Yasser Qadi is in the throes of a total meltdown, and it's simultaneously sad and hilarious to watch. It's sad because when he publicly admitted that there are problems with the Muslim view of the preservation of the Quran, many of us developed instant respect for him. We said, here's a man who's willing to acknowledge the truth, even if it gets him into trouble. This man is worthy of our respect. So it's sad to see him flailing around like a man who's drowning simply because he acknowledged the truth. But it's also hilarious because of what he did after the interview that completely destroyed the respect that we briefly had for him. After the interview, Qadi started throwing tantrums, backtracking, blaming Islamophobes for everything, blocking comments, and now filing false copyright complaints to get YouTube to take down videos that draw attention to what he said. In other words, Qadi obliterated the respect that he had gained, so that now Muslims view him as a traitor for admitting that there isn't just one Quran, and non-Muslims view him as a coward for backing down from an angry mob and for trying to cover up the epic dumpster fire that he and Muhammad Hijab created. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. The most advanced of our scholars they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered questions in there. After we get off this phone call, me and you, let's have a number of discussions, no problem. Beyond this, obviously I have no problem, we'll have discussions, we'll take my- Yasser Qadi backtracked and pulled the Islamophobia card on his Facebook page. After a recent interview with Brother Muhammad Hijab, some missionaries and anti-Muslim propagandists have read their own prejudice into our very brief discussion. Some of them have twisted my words to suit their agenda. While Muslim scholarship has pioneered Quranic studies for centuries and continues to do so, the fact remains that we all agree on the demonstrably proven fact that the Quran has been preserved in its entirety, word for word, and that we believe that all of the ten recitations of the Quran are revealed from Allah. To see such Islamophobes try to read in an argument that no one amongst us ever made in order to prove their incorrect narrative is only demonstrating the unethical tactics they resort to. That's right, we were twisting his words when he said that there are holes in the narrative. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. He also started filing false copyright complaints against videos that show the world what he said. Two days ago, I posted a video titled Secrets of the Quran featuring Sheikh Dr. Yasser Qadi. The video contained a bunch of clips of Qadi saying, this should never be discussed in public. Each of them followed by Jack Nicholson shouting, you can't handle the truth, since that's basically what Qadi was saying. Yesterday, I received this YouTube copyright takedown notification. Who ordered YouTube to take down my video? Yasser Qadi. On October 7th, I was flagged by Yasser Qadi as well. The video that was flagged was my short edit of several clips 
of the now famous incident where Qadi flopped around like a dying fish that had been brutally dragged ashore by Muhammad Hijab. At first, I was naturally inclined not to care. The video had gone way beyond my channel to David's and others, and its content had been seen in one form or another by hundreds of thousands of people, at least. One way or another, whether Qadi comes to his senses and withdraws his false complaint, or whether he gets laughed out of court, either way, the video is going back up. And we will celebrate when it does. Yasser Qadi and his ideology and his views are not exempt from criticism. So, Yasser Qadi, let's take a copyright quiz. In order to make a valid copyright complaint, what is at least one thing that you must have? A. A registered federal copyright. B. A registered federal copyright. C. A registered federal copyright. D. A registered federal copyright. Now, I'm sure that every single viewer knows the answer to this question, except for Yasser Qadi. But in order to make a valid copyright complaint, you need a registered federal copyright. Now, for question number two, this one's also for Yasser Qadi. At the time of filing your copyright complaints, did you have a registered federal copyright for the video I used where you flopped around like a dying fish? A. No. B. No. C. No. Or D. No. That's right. The answer is no. And the final question is for everyone. Did Yasser Qadi knowingly file false copyright complaints without a registered federal copyright and continue to file them even when he knew from experience that they could be successfully appealed. There's only one possible answer. Yes. So what's left for Yasser Qadi? He's been lying about the preservation of the Quran for decades, and when those lies are no longer possible to spread, he doesn't admit this to his Muslim audience. Instead, he tries to quietly distance himself from his former claims. I woke up this morning winning. Do you have any idea what it's like to wake up as the Dizzle? Fun fact, everyone, you're allowed to use clips of another person's video in order to criticize it. Sorry, Yasser Qadi, but I ain't your dimmy. Never have been, never will be. Now, Yasser Qadi is a scholar. He knows about fair use. Scholars rely on fair use whenever they quote someone else's work. But he filed a false copyright complaint anyway. Why? Well, this is a guy who will go to one group and say, So the Caliph Uthman standardized the copies of the Quran, and therefore, from his time up until our time, there has never been two copies of the Quran that are different even in one letter or one word, and this is because of the farsightedness of the Caliph Uthman. And then go to another group and say, And when we say, the various different ways to recite the Quran. We are not talking about different voices or different styles. We're talking about slight differences in pronunciations, slight differences in letters, especially those who have been exposed to uh, some of our brothers who live in Algeria or Morocco or other North African countries. They recite the Quran in a slightly different way, not just a voice or not just a, a, a speaking style, but also changes in letters and, and, and words and uh, harakat. So Sheikh Yasser Qadi decided that he just won't talk about the preservation of the Quran in public anymore because he knows that anything he says will contradict other things that he said and will be used to expose his lies. But even his refusal to discuss the preservation of the Quran was used against him, and in a panic, he filed a false copyright complaint. I submitted a counter notification and said that I'm willing to go to court over this, and this morning, YouTube said, Dear Act 17 Apologetics, in accordance with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, we've completed processing your counter notification. The following videos have been restored, unless you have deleted them. And that's the video that Yasser Qadi had taken down. So, it's back up now. Winning. Yasser Qadi lost. Now, as for the video in question, it has been restored on my channel. I've even updated the title, but there's still one problem. The video only has about 44,000 views, so be sure to watch the video and share it all around, even if you've seen it. Winning! Yasser Qadi lost. If you've been keeping up with the flaming downward death dive of Yasser Qadi's online career, you might have been thinking that it couldn't get any worse. Well, you would be wrong. In a recent video, I showed where Yasser Qadi responded to my tweet, admitting indirectly that he abused the YouTube copyright process because he wants all parts of his problematic interview with Muhammad Ajab scrubbed from the internet. Qadi's tweet contains a name. I didn't know what that was a reference to. However, given the tone of Qadi's tweet, I assumed it was some kind of slur or a double meaning known only to Yasser Qadi. This is where the sinister nature of Yasser Qadi begins to reveal itself. Yasser Qadi has been filing false copyright claims against numerous channels because he wants his embarrassing content removed, and he knows abusing the copyright policy is the only way he can hope to accomplish that task. YouTube's copyright claim process is garbage, just like Yasser Qadi's copyright claims themselves. They seem to go well together. Now, when appealing a copyright strike, the channel owner has to input a certain amount of personal information. That personal information gets sent to the claimant, in this case, Yasser Qadi. This is profoundly stupid, just like Yasser Qadi's copyright claims. What YouTube is doing, according to my attorney, is trying to mimic the federal copyright appeal process, but they do a terrible job of it. Normally, of course, personal information is protected through legal measures, not sent to a random YouTube claimant who can do whatever they want with the information. But what's important here is that Qadi is receiving names of channel owners, pseudonyms or names of lawyers who are appealing his false copyright claims. I received confirmation recently that the name Qadi refers to here isn't some kind of slur or double meaning, as I originally assumed. It's a name Qadi received that was sent to him in another copyright appeal, not mine. Qadi has filed so many copyright appeals, he apparently gets them mixed up. The channel Qadi is trying to refer to, like mine and so many others, also posted a video of Qadi without comment. So Qadi's accusations of lying and misinterpreting are just as dishonest as ever. 
But here's an additional sinister layer of Yasser Qadi. I can't take credit for this observation. It was made by a Muslim in the comment section. I'm a Muslim on the verge of leaving because of Gate and Quran Gate. Now this is a great time once again to pause and thank Yasser Qadi for helping Muslims leave Islam. He is excellent at reverse dawah. You probably know that this tweet is hiding a death threat. No, I actually didn't know that. I didn't assume that of Yasser Qadi. I thought that this was some sort of an insult, a slur, or some sort of a double meaning. He gave your real name. Of course, that isn't my real name, but Qadi thinks it is because he has so many copyright claim appeals, he can't keep him straight. The comment goes on to relate this incident with Qadi to what happened in France recently. Notice what happened here. To reply to my comment on Twitter, Qadi went through his records, found what he thought was my name, and posted that in a public comment, assuming, of course, he was divulging my identity. Now, first, this shows again Qadi's dishonesty with the whole copyright appeal process. Second, it shows his carelessness. You see, the names he's getting could be pseudonyms to protect the channel owners or the names of attorneys submitting the appeal. If it's a pseudonym, posting a name would be meaningless. If it's the name of someone's legal representation, well, who wants to see what would happen if Cotty doxed a federal copyright attorney? Yasser Cotty, until now, I was thinking you were merely dishonest, but I see now that you belong in the same barnyard as your other animal friends. And remember, this is the public version of Yasser Cotty. It's easy to guess he stinks even more when he's not being recorded. Enough is enough. Sheikh Yasser Qadi Sahib is back. The purpose of this library uh, chat is to basically uh, expose what I consider to be uh, the very evil tactics of this group of people. What the hell? I mean... <sighs> Mark my words. The meltdown is just getting started. Library chats number 10, responding to Jay Smith and David Wood on the holes in the narrative controversy. There are some typos here. It should say, Library tantrums number 10, whining about Jay Smith and David Wood in this holes in the narrative conniption. The ever boastful Dr. Qadi declares that he lays the smackdown on Islamophobes and Christian missionaries, and he invites viewers to like, comment, and share. Although it's hard to comment, since he already blocked comments. I have kept my cool with these people for way too long. It's not in my nature uh, to, to, to stoop to the level of every single barking dog. I just don't do that. I don't respond to stupidity and foolishness. As you're all aware, this is not my style. I do not attack people by name. Unfortunately, I have to break that rule for this one lecture. And just for once, give these idiots the smackdown that they deserve. So in this clip as well, we Yasser Qadi Bilawid said, look, I'm going to lay this matter to rest now. This is my smackdown. And you think, <laughs> you haven't even explained anything. You just said, yeah, there's 40 views, yeah, I'm not with that view, I'm with the other view. People like Jay Smith or David Wood or uh, their ilk. Uh, certainly I don't feel the, towards him like he feels towards us. What the hell? I mean, <sighs> these idiots, they are untrained, ignorant people. They are untrained, unqualified, ignorant, arrogant individuals, arrogant nincompoops. They have no integrity. They are utter fools, ignoramuses. Just listen to them and you know that they are utter jahil. So do you understand why it is insulting for someone like me to have to get involved with such a crowd? I have nothing to do with uh, these cretins whatsoever. Uh, there, there's an awful lot of uh, words that Yasser Khan used there that were quite strong. Uh, I'm not going to use those kind of words. I don't think it's appropriate. Uh, certainly, I don't feel the, towards him like he feels towards us. Listening to people like, like Jay makes me realize why there are still people who believe the earth is flat, you know? When you reach this level of idiocy, I mean, how and how, how do you even possibly respond to somebody who's such an ignoramus? Uh, I'm not going to use those kind of words. I don't think it's appropriate. An untrained idiot. He is incompetent. I mean, my mind is blown by such utter ignorance, utter ludicrousness. Wallahi, you wonder, is he even intelligent? Does he understand what he is saying? Does he know he's lying or is he mentally insane? You are not just a cretin of the highest magnitude. You have publicly humiliated yourself. I can't do this anymore. This person is not worth my time. Uh, certainly, I don't feel uh, towards him like he feels towards us. What the hell? I mean... <sighs> As for David Wood, I could not even bear an hour of his uh, lectures. I have rarely come across somebody who is more vulgar, vile, foul-mouthed, noxious, repugnant, depraved excuse of a preacher. Nobody who wishes to claim to follow any prophet of God would ever be so vulgar as this particular individual. Whatever he is, whatever he is, David Wood, it is obvious to any person of faith, is not a man of God. I'm vulgar, so I'm not a man of God. But notice, if I married a prepubescent girl, took the wife of my own adopted son, bought, owned, sold, and traded black African slaves, had sex with my slave girls, and allowed my followers to beat their wives into submission, rape their female captives, and hire prostitutes, I'd be the greatest man of God who ever lived. Welcome to the perfectly functioning moral compass of Sheikh Yasser Qadi. I don't know how to say this, like he is so uncouth. David Wood does not need anyone else to refute him. His own manners is enough of a refutation of the character of this individual. Now, what does he mean when he says I'm vulgar? I've posted well over a thousand videos, and many of you have been watching me for years. What sort of vulgar language do I use? What the hell? I don't curse, so what's he talking about? I mean, nobody who has an iota of humility in front of his creator, nobody who wishes to claim to follow any prophet of God would ever be so vulgar as this particular individual. No man of God would ever speak in such a vulgar fashion. Based on the authority of Dr. Qadi, 
we can now conclude that Muhammad and his companions were not men of God. Dr. Qadi is aware of the hadiths where Muhammad ordered his followers to tell certain people to go and bite their father's penises. There's a good discussion of this on the Muslim website, Islam Q&A. I'll link to the article in the description box. It was narrated from Ubay ibn Kab that a man boasted in an ignorant manner of his tribal lineage, so he told him to bite his father's male member, and he did not use a metaphor. The people looked askance at him, so he said to the people, I can see what you are thinking, and I can only say this, that the Messenger of Allah yada yada yada, instructed us, if you hear someone boasting in an ignorant manner of his tribal lineage, then tell him to bite his father's male member and do not use a metaphor. Now, can you imagine Dr. Qadi's reaction if he started telling us about Muhammad and we responded, if you like Muhammad so much, why don't you go and bite his penis? How would he react? These men cannot be from God. They're disgusting. They're filthy. They're depraved. They're degenerates. But Ubay ibn Qab told people to go bite their father's penises because Muhammad ordered him to use this vulgar language. Dr. Qadi's response? Alhamdulillah! Muhammad is the perfect example for all mankind. In History of Atabri, Volume 8, page 76, Abu Bakr says to a pagan, Go suck the clitoris of Allah. Allah was the goddess this pagan believed in and worshipped. So Abu Bakr, the first of the rightly guided caliphs, told a pagan in the presence of Muhammad to go perform oral sex on his goddess. Can you imagine Dr. Qadi's reaction if he went to my channel and found a video of me telling him to go perform oral sex on Allah? Telling a pagan to go suck Allah's clitoris would be like me telling Yasser Qadi to go lick Allah's balls. What would he say about me? He's a vulgar, obscene, evil jerk. I mean, honestly, there's nothing else to be said. But it's the first of the rightly guided caliphs using this kind of disgusting language, not me. How would Yasser Qadi react to Abu Bakr telling a pagan to go suck Allah's clitoris? Alhamdulillah! Now we can see why the Prophet subhanahu wa ta'ala loved Abu Bakr so much and wanted to deflower his prepubescent daughter. It's because of Abu Bakr's perfect manners. <sighs> Do you understand again why I have never had the patience to respond to such imbecility? Frankly, it is demeaning to my time, to my persona, to have to even get involved with people like these. I have to actually waste five hours and another hour doing this video to, to clear myself of ever being associated with a bunch of imbeciles like these. The fact is, as everybody knows, that you will find, generally speaking, uh, humility amongst the followers of Jesus Christ. The Quran itself mentions this. You will find, you know, a, a compassion. You will find a glimmer of the manners of Jesus Christ. And both Muslims and Christians will, uh, uh, agree that Jesus Christ was a loving, compassionate, humble, a caring person, uh, somebody who everybody around him loved. Everyone around Jesus loved him? Then why did they want to execute him? There were people who wanted to execute him for a few reasons. One of the reasons was that he ruthlessly rebuked and insulted hypocritical religious leaders who were keeping people away from the truth. He calls them hypocrites, children of hell, blind guides, blind fools, whitewashed tombs, serpents, and brood of vipers. Was that loving? Actually, yes it was. He told them exactly what they needed to hear. And even if they didn't listen, it was exactly what the people around him needed to hear about hypocritical religious leaders who were keeping people away from the truth. Now, why is Dr. Qadi bringing up Jesus? To condemn me for exposing Muhammad, the ultimate example of a hypocritical religious leader who kept people away from the truth. These idiots and ignoramuses, this is sheer lunacy. This is stupidity. These people are unscrupulous. Now, by the way, again, there are others of their ilk, and I listened to a few of them, and they're even more ignorant uh, than, than, than these two. This group of idiots, they have proven themselves to be arrogant jahids who are simply below my level of academic research. And they're also, some of them, not everyone, but especially one in particular, is a vulgar, obscene, evil jerk. I mean, honestly, there's nothing else to be said. Mark my words, the meltdown is just getting started. The uh, usage of my name is really uh, it's a slanderous appropriation uh, that frankly indicates the bankrupt nature of the tactics of this group and the paucity of their academic merit. He's saying you're using my name, you should stop using it. You guys, are, you know, you're misusing my holes in the narrative. <laughs> so that's what he said. Yeah, Muhammad. You know, he was with Muhammad Hijab. It don't press me. Yeah, Muhammad. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do what Deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. By the way, I'm a scuba diver. I'm an advanced rescue Nitrox uh, certified scuba diver, over 200 dives. So if you need a diver, believe me, I'm more than happy to go to go diving anywhere. I have been doing a deep, deep, deep dive into this issue. When you do a deep dive, I'm a scuba diver. When you do a deep dive, I'm a scuba diver. Things get very, very awkward and difficult. When you do a deep dive, I'm a scuba diver. When you do a deep dive, I'm, 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 I'm a scuba diver. Things get very, very awkward and difficult. Yeah, I'm more than happy to go to go diving anywhere. If I were to give you a blank muscle, uh, 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 let's not. Say. I'm a scuba diver. Yeah, I'm more than happy to go to go diving anywhere. If I were to give you a blank muscle, uh, 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 let's not. Let, let's. You, you're pushing me. Yeah, I'm a scuba diver. Yeah, I'm more than happy to go to go diving anywhere. If I were to give you a blank muscle, the standard narrative. 
has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The problem is he's never offered a response or any clarity. At the time, he did a pathetic job of trying to say, well, come on my course and buy my course and I'll explain it. <laughs> if I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and, uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference, would you write something which corresponds? It's not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. It is enough for the Muslim to believe that I Quran think this should be an easy yes or no, though. Yes, I, I have to. Be okay, very, very well. So, yeah, Muhammad, after we get off this phone call, me and you, let's have a number of discussions. No problem. I'm very yeah. open with advanced students. And, that's, and again, this is, I encourage anybody who is really interested to go deep to take the class. So that made zero sense. The bulk of the differences are tajweed and pronunciation related. I mean, for example, if I mean, let me just think of an example. Can you bring a glass of water to the garage? Okay, if an American says that. A Brit says it, how's he going to say it, right? Can you bring a glass of water to the garage, right? They speak in a higher pitched voice, right? Glass of water in a, into the garage. You know, there's differences, right? The British, rather, <laughs> the garage, bring, bring a bottle of water to the garage. Can you bring a glass of water to the garage, right? The British, rather, <laughs> the garage, bring bring a bottle of water to the garage is anybody going to say that these are two different versions to be fair obviously there are more differences uh, than pronunciation and there's sometimes there are differences and whatnot but again and then uh, inshallah ta'ala from after this lecture i'm going to move on uh, after you after you listen to this this lecture you will understand why uh, i'm not going to go back to engaging with this with this crowd at least share some view <laughs> this is like why doesn't he answer the question i mean i don't get what the like say something for god's sake since this is your last smackdown don't just say yeah you know water 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 i mean come on there's more to it than that so i am again what i don't want to there's no need to go into details in the video yes Qadi said well he's not going to explain it <laughs> and it's him who's really opened this kind of worms so i'm disappointed by him once again evading the question i think it's only expected that they will ride this wave and chase him till his last breath probably 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 <sighs> Mark my words, the meltdown is just getting started. As for the uh, Christian uh, missionaries who are out to convert to the Ummah, good luck with that. You've seen in the last, if you haven't learned anything, learn at least that missionary work has never been successful. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, never will be successful. Missionary work has never been successful. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, never will be successful. Missionary work has never been successful. Never been successful. Never been successful. Never been successful. Act 17, thank you for the help. I am an ex-Muslim because of you. Islam is a dark, terrible religion. Dear Yasser Qadi, whatever you like you can say about David Wood, but you can't dismiss the fact that he had made a Dawah man like me an apostate. I left Islam three years ago, and I am glad to be out of that cult. Missionary work has never been successful, uh, and Alhamdulillah never will be successful. I am an ex-Muslim from Egypt. Hallelujah, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Thanks, David Wood, for your efforts. You were one of the reasons I opened my eyes to the truth. Missionary work has never been successful, uh, and Alhamdulillah never will be successful. I was ex-Muslim, back to Jesus. Thank you, thank you, man, for showing me the right path. Hi, David. I am one of the many you saved. I am a 22-year-old Moroccan who left Islam this year. Ex-Muslim here too, accepted Jesus as my savior, been baptized last year. Thank you Jesus for saving me from that cult, learned a lot from Christian Prince and your channel. Missionary work has never been successful, uh, and Alhamdulillah never will be successful. With your help and that of Nabil, my wife was able to leave Islam, and we both have recently become Christians. Guys, I'm going to be an ex-Muslim in January 2021. I'm going to confess to my parents that I renounce Islam to accept Jesus Christ as my savior. Thanks to David Wood, Nabil Qureshi's book, and the Apostate Prophet. Please pray for me guys, I'm going to need all the help I can get. I'm so grateful to you. You saved me from this horrible religion. You opened my eyes. I couldn't thank you enough. New Christian here. I left Islam thanks to you, David Wood. You taught me the dark truth about my own religion. Missionary work has never been successful, uh, and Alhamdulillah never will be successful. I've been an ex-Muslim for years, and I now follow the Messiah, Jesus. I am also here, David, ex-Muslim. Gave my life to Christ three years ago. I decided to trust in Jesus. I am an ex-Muslim as well, now Christian for seven years, and I want to be an apologist like you, David. Thanks for your inspiration. May the Lord Jesus bless you immensely. You have no idea how many people are leaving Islam. Missionary work has never been successful, uh, and Alhamdulillah never will be successful. Hallelujah, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Accepted Jesus as my Savior, I decided to trust in Jesus, and I now follow the Messiah, Jesus. That I renounce Islam to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Allah. You know, actually, there is a word that comes to mind. I mean, it's still in my head from my GR, GRE days, almost uh, 20 years ago, I took the GRE. And um, there's, a, there's a word there. What is it? Uh, ultra crepidarian. <laughs> ultra crepidarians. <laughs> this is the word that comes to mind when I'm dealing with these people. Ultra crepidarian. You know, Sheikh Yasser Bali has clearly just, <laughs> for the most part of his life, just lived in a library. <laughs> ultra crepidarian memorize it and i hope that inshallah if one thing comes out of this lecture please oh muslims you know that are involved with this start using this word and popularize it again because that is exactly what these preachers are <laughs> no, people will be like what ultra crepidarian <laughs> that, is that some is that like a dinosaur ultra crepidarian ultra crepidarian <laughs> that, is that some is that like a dinosaur <laughs> Ultra crepidarian, ultra crepidarian, ultra crepidarian, ultra crepidarian, ultra crepidarian.
crepidirian. Oh, for 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 crepidirian. Uh, people like Jay Smith, uh, another group of uh, people that used to be Muslims. Uh, these uh, mutads, uh, they are so cringeworthy. It's frankly pathetic the lives that they're living. Untrained, unqualified, ignorant, arrogant individuals. They don't even read Arabic. It is a complete and total affront of my dignity as a scholar, as an academic, to even have to refute people of this nature. What the hell? I mean. I mean it's not in my nature to, to stoop to the level of every single barking dog. I just don't do that. I don't respond to stupidity and foolishness. Oh, for a crepidirian. 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 Give these idiots the smackdown that they deserve. Untrained, ignorant people who don't have a clue. Ultra crepidirian. Ultra crepidirian. Ultra crepidirian. Ultra crepidirian. Untrained, ignorant people who don't have a clue. Untrained, unqualified, ignorant, arrogant individuals. What the hell? I mean, what the hell? Untrained, unqualified, ignorant, arrogant individuals. They don't even read Arabic. What the hell? I mean, I mean. Oh, for a crepidirian. 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 I don't respond to stupidity and foolishness. What the hell? I mean, I mean. Oh, for a crepidirian. 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 I don't respond to stupidity and foolishness. What the hell? I mean, I mean, I don't respond to stupidity and foolishness. Oh, for a crepidirian. I have rarely come across somebody who is more vulgar, vile, foul mouthed, nicious, repugnant, depraved excuse of a preacher. What the hell? I mean, I mean, what the hell? Oh, for a crepidirian. 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 Now I wonder truly, does he know he's lying or is he mentally insane? Oh, for a crepidirian. Oh, for a crepidirian. Untrained, ignorant people who don't have a clue. Oh, for a crepidirian. 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 Does he know he's lying or is he mentally insane? What the hell? I mean, I mean. Oh, for a crepidirian. 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 Sometimes, yes, ignorance is bliss. Now I wonder truly, does he know he's lying or is he mentally insane? Welcome back to Variant Quran, I'm Dr. Daniel Brubaker. And uh, so I've now reviewed, I haven't watched the entire um, span of those remarks, but I have watched a, a portion of them, including some of the things that he mentions about me and his criticism of my work. And so I don't have time today to go and make a thorough um, point by point response to those things. Um, but I have written an email to uh, Yasser Khadi himself. He's a colleague of mine, we're on the same uh, list, serves academic, you know, obviously I don't know um, to what extent he's in and out of the uh, academic uh, discussions from time to time, but um, over the years we've been involved in those same kind of discussions. So, dear Yasser, I see that you have been talking about me and my work in online comments yesterday. The cherry picking of my doctoral dissertation is interesting. I've long been aware of the abjad matter of the Lam Hay, and it is for such reasons that everyone revises their dissertation before publishing a, as a scholarly monograph. I suspect you may have had things in your doctoral dissertation that you would similarly find immature today. There is a story behind my choice of wish a good morning as well that I may tell one day. If you're interested in corresponding or discussing these subjects in a professional manner, I am not averse. You made several misrepresentations of my words and claims and put words in my mouth that I did not say or write in your public comments. I do find fault for this, but will not allow it to stand in the way of a collegial relationship. We both may have a good number of productive years ahead of us. So that's kind of a long and roundabout way of saying it, but let's continue with uh, Yasser Khadi's uh, reply to me. Uh, he says, I understand when I make theolog a theological assumption and when I don't. Okay, great. I also understand when I make a theological assumption and when I don't. I don't think I make any too many theological assumptions in applying to my academic work. He says, in your case, I find it very repugnant that you are spoon-feeding well-known Islamophobes and Christian apologists who lack both genuine knowledge and integrity. Now, this is really an important aspect of this letter because, uh, well, spoon-feeding, I'm not sure what that means, except maybe that I'm 
uh, my uh, material is being made available, but it's already published in, in, in a book and, and it's out in other um, places uh, and so forth. It's out there to be discussed. So I don't know what spoon feeding means, except perhaps I'm having conversations and making myself available selectively to interviews and things like that. And I haven't said yes to that many interviews with, uh, with folks. But this word Islamophobe, I just want to mention that for a moment. I want you to notice that the word Islamophobe is not uh, a scholarly word. It's not a word that I, I actually don't respect or I lose respect for academics and scholars when they use this word because it's a term of propaganda. It's a term of rhetoric, uh, really, that is used to discredit someone or to um, uh, tar them. It is another word that is, uh, in fact, a, um, an ad hominem word. It's, it's used to apply to people that you don't want other people to listen to. This word today is typically applied to people who anybody can be applied and can have this word applied to them. Whether somebody is critical of uh, Islam or uh, nobody wants to be around people who are unkind to other human beings just because of what they believe or, or where they come from or what they look like or anything like that. So I never endorse that sort of thing. But notice that Islam is not a it's not an ethnicity. It's not a um, nation of origin or anything like that. It is a, um, a system of beliefs. And so to place any criticism of a belief system off limits and to say that not speaking well of it or indeed you know, speaking ill of it is is somehow bad or reprehensible or what's the word repugnant as <laughs> the word that uh, Yasser Khadi uses here is uh, really actually it's being protective of something and it's placing uh, limits on it. It, it, you, can, you can criticize anything else but you can't criticize this and so beyond being a term of rhetoric I think it's also a term of cowardice. Yasser Khadi and his ideology and his views are not exempt from criticism. He insisted that the Muslim community has to be shielded from reality because it should not be said in public and I would never bring it up in public and I don't think it is wise to bring it up in public. I don't even want to be explicit. It should only be discussed amongst those who are familiar with this science. I never brought this topic up myself. It should never be brought up in public. This is not something you discuss amongst the masses. I encourage anybody who is really interested to go deep to take the class. I do this class. It'll be one year later. I'm a hummer and I'm a prophet because I said so. I have this hairy bow right on my shoulder, you know. And my best buddy Allah, he works for me though. I call him God to make his ink pure as white snow. To take the class. In the damp cave of Hira, I met this bad man. He squeezed me until I threw up the Quran. When I ran to Khadija in anguish Go and deep. fears, she explained, This is too brief and wiped off my tears. To take the class. I'm a and a prophet because I am him. And Allah caters to my needs and every win. His reward is that I let people think he is Lord. Then he lets me torment the people when I get bored. Now the world must revert and become just like me. Go deep. And never ask questions and never be free. You'll become dumb blind Muslims and do as you're told. Or your heads will be rolling, your family's soul. Oh, Aisha. Ooh la la, what a pretty dress. May I wear it? Your dress is get those revelations rolling. No, don't touch my eye makeup. Mine is too young for makeup. I'm 54 after all. To take the class. My religion is long, grew like from thy on bread. Due to people's reluctance to part with their head. And because I got rid of the people who think Allah slaves can be duped to do things that sure stink. I'm Muhammad, I'm a prophet because I said it. I need to be to bring you when I'm in need of me. Go deep. And my best is for the Allah delivers some To take the class. These girls and boys and slaves and all these riches of mine. Oh, Aisha, Allah is cutting my aorta off. The backlash over Sheikh Yasser Qadi's claims in the now infamous Holes in the Narrative interview has convinced him to leave social media. Uh, I am I'm very serious, this is not just statements, I'm very serious inshallah of slowly withdrawing from social media um, completely and uh, and having alternative platforms because I feel that um, I, I am not, um, I, I don't want to be involved too long on public platforms, I'm going to be gravitating towards uh, not being involved in public anymore uh, and I'm just I'm just preparing the way for that inshallah Allah before it happens inshallah, this is my goal in a few years at max inshallah. Think about this. For years, Muslim apologists and Muslim scholars have lied to the Muslim community about the preservation of the Quran. It's now gotten so bad that if a Muslim scholar even tries to speak the truth, if a Muslim scholar attempts even for one interview to be honest, he'll be shamed and harassed off the internet. What is this religion? What kind of religion compels its adherents to love lies and to despise the truth? Non-Muslims would have been sympathetic towards Sheikh Yasser Qadi because of the way his community has been treating him, but their sympathy is undermined when they remember two things. One, that Dr. Qadi was one of the Muslim scholars who spent years spreading the myth of perfect preservation, and two, that Dr. Qadi has been filing false copyright complaints against people who spread his comments about the holes in the narrative. This man is a deceiver, like his god and like his prophet. So, he doesn't deserve anyone's sympathy when his own community attacks him for a brief moment of honesty. How can things get any worse for Muslim apologists? We'll have to wait and see, but one thing is certain. The Islamic apologetics meltdown, as epic as it's been, is just getting started. It's not just Muslim myths about the Quran that are being exposed. Muslim myths about Muhammad are being exposed as well by Dr. Qadi. Cheers and Yasser Qadi tears. That the standard narrative, that the 
standard narrative Boy. that the standard narrative You'll finish as holes as holes that the standard narrative that the standard narrative Boy. that the standard narrative You'll finish as holes finish. as holes this is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of Nongka, you're like, what is all of this going on? What is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize. Every single student of knowledge knows who studies Ulum al Quran that the most difficult topics are Ahruf and Qiraat. And the concept of Ahruf and the reality of Ahruf and the relationship of the Rahmanic Mus'af with the Ahruf and the preservation of the Ahruf is it one, is it three, is it seven, and the relationship of the Qiraat to the Ahruf. This is a topic that. When you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qiraat caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet said, if you want to listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. Ubay is not some even average Sahabi. He is the Qari of the Quran. He is the master. He is who he is. And he goes, Fadakha al nafsi shak. What is all of this stuff? Um, again, this is the few. You ask me a very honest question. This is the first time I'm saying these things. Many people are aware who listen to my lectures that I've mentioned the crises that happened to me at Yale. This was the issue. That the issue of ahruf and preservation and qiraat and relationships between them, these are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars, they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered questions in there. Here's the point these issues should only be discussed amongst people who know what the qiraat are and who understand some of these questions that are being so, raised. So what you're saying, the shaykh that came, or not the shaykh, but the, the crisis that you had was in relation to this question of the relationship between the Ahruf and the Qiraat, basically. No, no, the crisis I had wasn't that. The crisis I had was, well, yeah, wait, that, that, that was what generated. What was the crisis? The crisis was very simple. Traditional understandings of Ahruf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. You see, in a Muslim environment, there's always some respect that we have for the Quran. We should. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit, and then we'll say, okay, khalas, salir, and, Allah, and that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, the, the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're going to just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true. And this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. They'll bring you riwayat and they'll bring you athal. And then you add to that very well-known issues of, I don't even want to be explicit. And then you bring on top of that makhlul thought. And then and then. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. These are now well known within the Western Academy uh, that they're bringing forth issues. Their level of now knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be you know, 100 years ago. What is happening in the last few years is not me anymore. It's the Western academics. These, these problems are now becoming mainstream. And by and large, our ulama in the Eastern world are not aware, by and large, of what's going on in the Western side of things. And they're not answering those questions. in a